In this lesson, we're going to look at wave properties. The first aim is to compare transverse and longitudinal waves, then describe the properties of a wave using graphs, and then finally explain how to use the wave speed equation, including a bit on standard form. Now, I think the idea of waves is quite confusing because it's very abstract. What do we mean when we say something travels as a wave? I mean, particles we understand. I imagine particles to be like tiny footballs being kicked around by environmental forces. And that's quite easy to get to grips with. But what is a wave? The easiest way to explain it to you is when energy travels, scientists have noticed that in some ways it behaves like a particle. In other words, it can be reflected and their speed can slow down as they travel through mediums of different density. But energy such as light and sound, they travel as waves. And we call them waves because they behave like waves in water. Let me explain. Imagine you've ventured waist deep into the seafront and the waves are passing through you. Now you might imagine in this situation that your body would get knocked back by the force of the waves. But if you think about it, that doesn't actually happen. What happens instead is your body moves up and down, in other words, at right angles to the direction of the wave travelling. So it's the way in which, say, light energy behaves that has resulted in us calling it a wave because it behaves much like a water wave. One other essential point is waves transfer energy and information, not matter. This has come up as a multiple choice tick box question quite a few times in an exam. People normally remember energy, but they forget information. That's why we can use waves for mobile phone communication or satellite communication, for example. So there are two types of waves. One, transverse waves. Uh, this is when particles vibrate at 90 degrees to the direction of energy flow. That's just like the water waves I've shown you. And examples of that which you must know are light electromagnetic waves. Light is an electromagnetic wave, but it's the one which we're most familiar with, so I'm putting it separately. But things like UV, X-ray, radio waves, gamma rays, infrared, all those travel as transverse waves. Water waves are transverse. And S waves, this is to do with earthquakes, and you'll learn about that in the earthquakes lesson. So the idea is that as energy travels forward, the particles are disturbed at 90 degrees to the direction of energy flow, in other words, at right angles. Whereas with longitudinal waves, this is a second type of wave, particles vibrate in the same direction as energy flow. And examples of longitudinal waves are sound waves, any sound wave, ultrasound, that's above the range we can detect, and infrasound, that's below the range we can detect, and P waves, which are basically waves which originate from earthquakes. So, as the energy travels forward, particles move back and forth. They're disturbed back and forth. We commonly use a slinky spring in a lab to demonstrate this. So this will quickly show you how to model transverse and longitudinal waves using a slinky. So with transverse waves, as the wave moves forward, the slinky coils move up and down, as you can see. Here it is in slow motion. And here with longitudinal waves, you can see that as the wave moves forward, the slinky coils move back and forth. So that is how you compare transverse and longitudinal waves. Remember, transverse particles are disturbed up and down, longitudinal back and forth. So now let's understand the properties of a wave by looking at wave graphs. We get pictures of waves using an oscilloscope and they end up looking like this. Oscilloscopes in a school lab are generally used to detect sound waves, but they can be used to interpret any sort of wave. So the first property of waves is wavelength. This is the distance from peak to peak or similar point to another similar point. So this point is the peak of a wave. This is the trough of a wave, if you like. Sometimes we call the peak the crest of a wave. So a surfer would surf on the crest of the wave. And one wavelength would be the distance from here to here. The symbol for wavelength is this odd upside down Y shape called lambda. And wavelength is generally measured in meters but can be measured in any sort of unit of distance, centimeters, nanometers. So that's just one way we can measure wavelength but we could also put it for example here and that would be another wavelength because we're starting at one point in wave and finding the same point on the next wave. So in exams, they quite commonly ask you, how many waves do you see in this picture? And the answer would be one here and another one here. So two waves in total. Next up is amplitude. And amplitude is the amount of energy the wave carries. So in sound, a high amplitude would be perceived as loud sound. And in light, a high amplitude would be a bright light. 
we measure amplitude from the halfway point to the peak or trough of a wave. So this is amplitude. But again, it's important to be flexible. They could put this anywhere, like here in an exam, or even here. Just remember, it's from the halfway point to the peak of a wave. And the bigger this distance is, the more energy the wave carries, the more damage it could do, or the brighter it would be, or the louder it would be. So finally, let's look at frequency. This is the number of waves per second, or rather, let's say this was a point in space, the number of waves passing this point every second. On a graph like this, you'd interpret the frequency as the number of waves you actually see on the graph, and you'll assume this is one second of time, unless stated otherwise. So frequency can be calculated by dividing the number of waves you see over time in seconds. Frequency is measured in hertz, H-E-R-Z, or one hertz there, and that would be one wave per second. One hertz is one wave per second. It can also be measured in kilohertz, which would be thousand per second, and megahertz, which is one million waves per second. Sometimes in exams, they will show sound waves, and only sound waves, not light waves, like this, like a particle diagram. If you remember, sound waves cause particles to move back and forth. That means there'll be times when the particles are compressed together and times when they're spread out. A bit like a worm moving by contracting and expanding. When particles are close together, we call that a compression, and when they're spaced out, we call them rarefactions. So, one wavelength could be the distance between one compression to the next compression, or from one rarefaction to the next rarefaction. Just be aware of that. So let's give waves a bit of a real-world context. Here I'm going to show you a piece of music being played, and we're going to relate it to different ways we can express waves on a graph. So notice this one has a high frequency because there's lots of waves here. One, two, three, four. So a frequency of four hertz, uh, assuming this is one second of time. And it has a low amplitude, so we expect a quieter sound here, but a high pitch sound. You see, high frequency means high pitched in sound waves anyway. In light waves, it means different colors of light. So red light is lower frequency than, let's say, violet light. In this part, we've got a high amplitude, so we expect a louder sound, but we've got a lower frequency because there's only two waves now, not four. And finally, in this one, we've got a high amplitude because the distance between the halfway point is high, but we've got a high frequency as well. So we expect a high pitch sound here and a lower pitch sound here. Let's see how this plays out. So what I'm going to do is play this piece and I'm going to move the picture when it relates to the various graphs drawn. So we're starting off high and quiet. Now we're going low and louder. High and loud. Low and loud. High and loud. So you can see, hopefully, how we can express different pitches of sound and different loudnesses of sound using these wave graphs. And pitch is basically a way we interpret frequency in sound, and loudness is how we interpret amplitude in sound. Remember, in light, amplitude refers to the brightness, and frequency refers to the colour perceived. And that is how we describe the properties of a wave. So physics is basically a language of math, so let's look at some of the maths in physics. Here we'll look at the wave speed equation. Now light speed in a vacuum you need to know, so light speed, how it travels through space, it travels at an amazing 300 million meters per second. A vacuum is basically an area where there are no particles whatsoever. For this reason sound cannot be heard in a vacuum because sound needs particles to conduct itself. So whether it's visible light or infrared or UV, they all travel, all electromagnetic waves released from the sun travel at 300 million meters per second in a vacuum at the same speed. And you do need to know that, that you get tested on as well. The speed of sound, by contrast, in air, not in space, because I told you sound doesn't travel in space in a vacuum, is 330 meters per second. That is so much slower than speed of light. Even though when I'm speaking to you or someone's speaking to you, the sound feels instantaneous, but that's because you're listening from a very close distance, presumably. If I was shouting across a large field, let's say I was standing 330 meters away from you, it would take one second for that sound to reach you. You'd notice the delay between seeing someone moving in the distance and actually hearing them. 
the best example of this is thunder and lightning. When a lightning strike occurs, the light reaches you very quickly because it's traveling close to that speed, and the sound, traveling much slower, takes a while to reach you. The bigger the delay between the light and the sound, the further away the uh, lightning strike is. So now let's look at the actual equation itself. The equation can be expressed as velocity, wave speed, how fast it travels, equals frequency of a wave times by the wavelength. So I've got wave speed here, I've got frequency here, and I've got wavelength here. Now on the foundation paper this will be easy, this will be written at the front and you just need to basically plug in the right numbers from the question. On a higher paper they might make it more difficult in two ways. One, you might be required to rearrange the equation for example, uh, wave speed divided by frequency is wavelength, or wave speed divided by wavelength is frequency. If you're not sure how to rearrange equations, I'll do a very quick separate tutorial on how to rearrange equations and not go into it here. Make sure you pay attention to the units as well. So this wave speed is in meters per second, frequency is generally in hertz, and wavelength generally in meters. Another more straightforward way you can calculate wave speed, if you just think about it as speed, then you just do distance over time. And I'm sure you've heard of that equation before. To calculate the speed of anything, it's the distance covered over time. That's why it's meters per second, distance over time. So let's have a bit of practice trying some of these out. First question, a wave machine is switched on in a swimming pool. Two waves pass you each second. The crest of the waves are 1.5 meters apart. Calculate the wave speed. So all you have to do is scan the question for where the figures are given to you. So we know the frequency is two waves passing you every second, so two hertz. We know that the wavelength is 1.5 meters because the crest to crest distance is 1.5 meters. So we've got frequency, which is two hertz, and we've got wavelength, which is 1.5 meters. So you just do 2 times 1.5 to work out the wave speed. So the wave speed would be 2 times 1.5, which is 3 meters per second. So now let's try question 2. A wave travels at 40 meters in 10 seconds. Calculate the speed of the wave. So which equation do we need now? Frequency times wavelength or distance over time? Well, we've got distance, 40 meters, so let's underline that. So 40 meters in 10 seconds, that is time, obviously, so let's underline that. So what we're doing here is 40 divided by 10. So if you divide 40 by 10, you will get 4 meters per second. Okay, but this is relatively easy. Let's step it up a bit onto the higher level. So now we're going to look at equations using standard form. When using standard form, the first number, as you can see here, and here, and here, and here, must be between 1 and 10. And then it's always multiplied by 10 to the power of another number, be it a positive number like 6 and 14, or a negative number like 23 and 3. So why do scientists use standard form? Well, if you think about the job of an astrophysicist, when they have to look at things on an astronomically large scale, you have to deal with very, very large numbers, which can take up a lot of space on a page. So it's much easier to simplify them in terms of numbers like this. Similarly, if you're a biologist or also a physicist or a chemist, you may be looking at very, very small things, which again, take up a lot of space. Like Here's a couple of examples, but obviously the number could be much longer than that as well. And again, it helps to simplify it to save space using standard form. Now, although standard form is really a higher paper thing, it's not difficult, so anyone can really learn it. For example, take the number 1 million. How would we write that in standard form? You'd write 1 to represent that number there, and then multiply it by 10 to the power of 6. In other words, that means behind the 1 there are six zeros, six positions, six positions. If we look at a larger number like 1,430,000,000, well, then we have to write 1.43, so I've decimalized here and added the 4,3, because remember, the number has to be between 1 and 10. And then you multiply it by 10 to the power of 9. Now, this might confuse you, because you might think, hang on, there's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 zeros there, where's the 9 come from? Well, look at where I've put the decimal point. 
it's over here. And after this point, there are nine figures. So that's what you're doing here. You're counting the number of positions after the decimal point. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Now standard form can work the other way. We can have 0 0.005, and that'd be expressed as five times 10 to the minus three. What that means is, imagine five, imagine these weren't here, you just had five. To create this figure, what I've done is had to move the decimal point back one, two, three positions, minus three. And let's look at a slightly more complicated one, so 0 0.00034. Well, that would be expressed as 3.4 times 10 to the minus four. Remember, I can't write 34 because the number has to be between one and 10 to make it standard form. So here I'm putting my decimal point here, and minus four means I'm moving back four spaces. One, two, three, four. Notice that the standard form figure minus three here results in two zeros before the decimal point, and four here, or minus four, is three zeros. So the number zeros is one less than the standard form. If you know that, it will save you having to count the decimal positions. So how do we use standard form when performing a calculation? So let's look at when we're multiplying, because you'll only have to really use this in Physics 1 uh, when multiplying or dividing numbers. When we multiply numbers, we have to add the standard form values. So look here, we have 3 times 10 to the 8 multiplied by 4 times 10 to the 3. What's the answer? Step one, multiply the whole numbers first. So deal with this and this first. So three times four is 12. Step two, add the powers. So if we add 10 to the eight and 10 to the three, we get 10 to the 11, eight plus three, 11. Step three, combine the answers. So 12 times 10 to the 11, but this isn't standard form because the number has to be between one and 10. So we move the decimal point back one to make it 1.2, but by doing that, we have to multiply it by one more power, so 10 to the 12. So remember, when you have to move a decimal point back, you have to add one number here for every position moved back. So what about when we're dividing? Well, when we divide numbers, we have to subtract the standard form. So here we have four times 10 to the three divided by eight times 10 to the eight. Step one, divide the whole numbers. So four divided by eight, ignore this bit. So four divided by eight is 0 0.5. Step two, subtract the powers. So 10 to the power of three, subtract 10 to the power of eight will be 10 to the power of minus five. Three take away eight is minus five. That's totally fine to do. Do not worry that you're going into the negative. Step four, combine the answers, so 0 0.5 times 10 to the minus five. But once again, this number is below one. It must be between one and 10. So we have to move the decimal place forward one. So that becomes five times 10 to the power of minus six. So when we move it forward one, we're basically taking away a power. Now, because it's negative, if we take away a power, it becomes more negative, so minus six. So remember, when we move the decimal place back, we add one power, and if we're moving the decimal place forward, we subtract one power. So let's try one question. A wave travels at three times 10 to the eight meters per second, that's 300 million meters per second, and has a wavelength of six times 10 to the minus five meters. Calculate its frequency. So if you remember, velocity divided by wavelength equals frequency. So let's substitute our figures. Velocity is three times 10 to the eight, and uh, wavelength is 6 times 10 to the minus 5. So this is our uh, calculation. So step 1, 3 divided by 6, which is 0 0.5. Step 2, subtract the powers, so 8 minus minus 5. And if you subtract a negative number, it's the same as adding the numbers together. They just think those two negative lines can form a positive. So that will give you the power of 13, 10 to the power of 13 and then combine together. So 0 0.5 times 10 to the 13, but you may have spotted, we can't have 0 0.5, it must be in terms of five. So we move the decimal point forward one to give us five, and as a result, we subtract one power. So it's five times 10 to the 12, because we've moved that decimal point forward. And that's how we explain how to use the wave speed equation.